Uh, thank you, Mariella, uh, for most of that. Um, <laughs> now, we're moving away from great moments to trivia, you might say. Um, I've called this talk Amar Kord, as you know, that's the name of the film that Fellini made about growing up in Rimini. People thought that it was about himself, and there's a sense in which all of Fellini's work is about himself, but in fact, it was about the birth of fascism and about what it was like to be a Catholic boy, what it was like to be even a plump Catholic boy. I met Fellini in the summer of 1974, I think it must have been. I could be more precise if my archive hadn't been sold to the University of Melbourne. But, <laughs> so I couldn't really check anything. But if I'm right, I was 35 and Federico was 54. And he was the king of Cinecitta. But Cinecitta was no longer the Hollywood on Tiber that it had been in the 50s. And one of the jobs that Fellini gave himself was to keep Cinecitta alive. Paolo Rolli, who was a, a well-known casting director then, she was already ill with the disease that killed her, but Paola had suggested me for the role of the giantess in Casanova. I didn't really want to play a giantess in Casanova, <laughs> but I quite liked the idea of, of seeing Cinecitta and visiting uh, Fellini and seeing what was going on. So I hopped into my station wagon. I left my little wee house in the Montanare di Cortona on the hottest day of the year and got to Cinecitta in time for lunch. I was wearing nothing but a dress. Uh, this was my habit, in fact, and it never ceased to annoy Fellini. Come ti permetti? Lunch for the crew had already been set out, highly informal, and Fellini kept looking at me with his eyes screwed up. Not listening to a word I said, I didn't say that much, but sort of peering at me as if from a distance, watching me rather than listening to me. And I learned then that Fellini made storyboards for his films, uh, a bit like making uh, a storyboard for a commercial in which, of course, Fellini had always been very interested. And commercials already made a use of the picture space that they still do, which is the most charged and the most interesting, which can be watched again and again. But those were the high days, of course, of advertising. I was given to understand that I wouldn't do for the giantess. For one thing, I wasn't big enough. The woman who eventually played it was seven foot seven. <laughs> Uh, she was a famous huge person called Sandy Allen, American. He had another idea. I would pay, play a character he was calling Madame Châtelet. Now, I had really admired Fellini ever since I saw Notti di Cabiria way back in Australia in 1959 or so. I thought then that this looked to me like the final emancipation of the cinema from the narrative, that the structure of the film, that it appears to be a narrative which is then photographed, um, seemed to me to be impossibly limiting, that you could make films in which the images gave rise to other images, and the image was the statement, and I thought this was the way that movies had to go. There were some terrific movies made the same year as Notti di Cabiria, but I thought this was the future. And there is, I have some reason to believe that Fellini is possibly still the most influential cinematographer. What I thought about Notti di Cabiria was that it moved at its, with its own momentum. It built up speed and it slowed down and it was phantasmagoric and real. I also thought it was profoundly Italian and this to me is an important thing about Fellini, he couldn't really have come from anywhere else. Nowadays, people talk of Notti di Cabiria as a masterpiece by Giulietta, but in fact, I think I understood even then that the, the real genius here, the real creative entity was Fellini himself, who designed every inch of it. He was 
merciless to actors because they were images and they thought they were performances. But as I was to learn, as I got to know Fellini a bit better, that's not really how it worked. He created Cabiria and he would later create Gelsomina by putting a bowl on her head, cutting her hair around it, then spiking it all out, then making her face with all kinds of white things to try and get it to be matte and white so that it was like a kabuki mask. This is what I thought cinema was going to be like. And I can still remember extraordinary scenes in Cabiria, like the ones in the church. And I was brought up a Catholic child under the same kind of intellectual and emotional constrictions that he had as a boy in Italy. And for me to see the way he looked at the church situation, uh, half being caught up in it, but also being profoundly detached from it, was the way forward, the way to understand what was going on. So I went on seeing Fellini when I was in Australia, then I came to Europe on my, um, on my Commonwealth scholarship. Now after lunch, Federico gave me the script for the movie, uh, insofar as there was a script for the movie, a uh, work very much in progress. He wanted to know what I thought of it, and if I would consider the part of Madame Châtelet in a scene in which Casanova meets Rousseau, who is a little old man, in the arms of an enormous breasted balia. <laughs> and I'm afraid I got rather annoyed. And I wrote him, a, I rewrote the scene. Can you imagine? And I sent it to him. And I made Madame Châtelet, Madame la Marquise du Châtelet. He'd taken away everything, including her particle. And this was an extraordinary woman who popularized Leibniz and who preferred to be in her house in broad daylight with the curtains drawn wearing all her diamonds and doing math. I mean, how could you not adore her? Why would you, why would you turn her into uh, a lump? Um, one, of his, one of those figures that keeps coming back in Fellini. His response, and this is typical of Fellini, I think, was to immediately call for his Mercedes, well, the next day, and drive all the way up the, the Autostrada and to my little weeny house in the mountains, which he would come to call my Castello di Fata. And I was supposed to be La Fata ai, ai Capelli Turchini from Pinocchio. Just so I'd know that part, he sent me the book. But typically he had it sent from the bookshop and he didn't write anything in it. So I can't prove that Fellini <laughs> gave it to me. And so this big blue Mercedes appears at the top of my steep rocky road. Fellini hops out with a little overnight bag <laughs> and sent the driver away till the next morning. Hadn't asked me. <laughs> we talked all afternoon about the concept of the film and to some purpose, I think, um, even though Federico continued to watch me and not listen to me. I would have made supper but Federico was even more fussy and valetudinarian than the average Italian man, and he insisted on making risotto bianco for himself with one leaf of basil. <laughs> he was already on beta blockers and drank no wine whatsoever. There was never any question of his sleeping anywhere, but in the big bed with me, it was the only bed I had, um, but he was horrified to find that I slept, and this is typically Italian as well, with the windows open. He changed into brown silk pajamas with cream piping that he brought in his little bag and he hung his clothes carefully up for the next day that every couple of hours he would make a quick call to Giulietta. He, did, he always did it, every, but he never said anything. He'd just grunt on the phone. They somehow reassured each other back home in their apartment on the Via Margutta. Later, when all the oil lamps had been extinguished, a tiny bat flew into the bedroom and made a couple of circuits before flying out again. Federico was terrified. Did I not know that a bat had flown into his hair when he was a child? <laughs> Nonsense, I said. The bat would, ha would have had a better idea of where your hair is than you do. He began to pant. I kept two fingers on his pulse, which was bouncing around like a frog in a bucket. It calmed down eventually. I'm sorry I frightened you, he said, when I told him that I hadn't been frightened at all and was simply trying to figure out what I would say to the papers if he carked it in my bed. 
And it's typical of Federico that when I said that, he just laughed. He had the most wonderful laugh. To my surprise, he couldn't wait the next morning to go into Cortona, our little medieval country town, and I thought, you know, we would keep a low profile. Oh, no. I mean, he, into, he, he strode into Cortona as if he was just about to make the biggest blockbuster in the world, and everyone shouted out, Maestro Fellini! And he wanted me to see how famous he was, how important he was. <laughs> Never introduced me to anybody, which is fine. <laughs> Anyway, he, after, I, I'll telescope this a bit because he then decided, because I had this little dark house full of bats, he said, I'm going to give you light. I'm going to give you a generator. I thought I'd get some old generator that was on a movie lot somewhere, but in fact I didn't. I got a brand new generator, which was the bane of my life. And he said, whenever you turn the lights on, you will bless me. I said, no, when they don't work, I'm going to curse you, is what people do. People are not grateful. <laughs> but what actually happened here is that we had long talks about Casanova as a movie, and I actually saw a rough cut of Casanova, so, and I actually heard the thing that is so amazing, which is Fellini playing all the roles. His, it had this studio sound, which as you know, with it, most Italian films, and certainly all of his, would have all been dubbed. And so we argued about what his career really meant. And in the end, I said to Federico, look, this is a man who is impotent, emotionally impotent. He cannot achieve intimacy. The correct relation, the person who is his patent, his partner in the film, is the doll. And he said, he always listened when we talked in this way. And he did go away and he did think about it and he did actually make that the final scene of the movie and his judgment. There is a famous quotation by Costanzo Costantini, a journalist with whom I was having a libel suit at the time, <laughs> that he had said that uh, Casanova was a, a sperm-filled waxwork with the eyes of a masturbator. <laughs> he, he didn't say that. He did say that he was a stronzo, which is more likely. Uh, then he made the film called La Città delle Donne, and there are many people who think that the feminist in that film, who is played by Sylvie Mayer, is supposed to be me. Um, but it isn't really. But it was an odd moment to realize. I had said to him about Giulietta degli Spiriti. He never talked about his work, but he did ask me about that film. And I said, I was a bit angry with you for commandeering, co-opting um, Giulietta's fantasy life and Giulietta's emotional experience and turning it into yours. I think that's really not fair, but that was a thing that he was likely to do. And in a way, I escaped. My relationship with him lasted eight years in all. The Australian press seemed to interpret that as a one-night stand, <laughs> which may have something to do with being on the wrong side of the world, I'm not sure. Um, and we remained very good friends. I remember writing, I wrote a piece about him when quite late in his life, and Giulietta said to him, ti conosce, sai, she knows you, you know, uh, for which I take as a great compliment. But I will stick to this vision that I have of him as the man who could have rescued cinema from narration and the demands of narration, and nearly from actors. You may know, some of you, that I had actors put into Room 101 when I did it to gales of applause. If they would just bloody stop acting, please, just do it. And of course, Federico did all the acting. The other thing he did that drove actors mad was he replaced bits of them that he didn't like with bits of other people. So they would see their performances in which they had the back of one other person and the hands of another person and then the voice of another person. And all the time they were actually in the filming, he was doing all the reacting and all the talking and all the feeling. It was an extraordinary time, the time of Fellini, and I'm very sad to have to admit to myself that it's over. But it comes back in bits. If you saw Montalbano, the, that Italian series made for La Rai about a young uh, policeman, it had so many Fellinian moments, so many Fellinian characters who always filled the stage. He was the one person who would take a little fisherman who spoke the most villainous dialect that no, nobody could understand and turn him into, for a second, a hero. 
He is a great man. I shall not see his like again.